They were there. They weren't really there. So if you want to go ahead and open with me in Mark chapter 11, that's where we'll spend our time this morning. And then I do want to look at several cross-references, references from other Gospels, but also some prophecies. And we're going to talk about some of those lasting lessons, things that we need to remember about Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And let me start by asking those questions, too. Uh, what would you say, and I'm curious, and I've kind of laid the groundwork there for it, but is it possible to be a part of something great and then greatly miss out on the occasion? It happened to me recently. Whether it's intended or unintended, it does happen. Or is it possible to be present and then not really present? How often are we physically in one place and emotional? Maybe even just mentally somewhere else. Is it possible to be very, very close and yet all the while very far? And you think about that. It's that the, the possibility is there. To, to be engaged and not be engaged, to be present and not be present. Well, you'll recall that in, on January 6th this year, when President Trump was giving a speech in front of the White House, during his speech, crowds were gathering around the Capitol Hill and all really along the Washington Mall. And then while he's giving this speech, crowds are gathering around Capitol Hill, which eventually led to some kind of storming of the buildings. They call it an insurrection. I don't know that it is. But all kinds of people were pushing and shoving their way in. And the national news managed to catch a whole lot of that event. Unfortunately, the police was unable to capture the criminals. It's kind of a strange day to say the least. Do you remember that day? I don't think that we'll ever be able to forget it. You think about all the videos, all the pictures. In fact, they play them often. Even still, they're in the news as it's being ingrained in us and we're being reminded constantly, even if we want to forget, we can't. It's there. It's in our minds. Now, you think about the day when Christ rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Without the news media, without social media, without pictures and videos, you can only imagine the playback for those disciples. What it was like that day. It was ingrained in their minds. They'll never be able to forget it. They were there, but they weren't really there. They, they were a part of it, but they weren't really a part of it. They didn't fully understand what was happening. Now, when you look back in that story, there were crowds of people, even his closest friends, his disciples. They were all there. They were all present as Jesus openly rides into Jerusalem and allows himself to be praised and worshipped, recognized as the Messiah. He allowed it to happen this way. Now, a part of the context, though, Besides the crowds and all that's happening in Jerusalem, let me give a little bit more of the backstory to what's going on. Where do these crowds come from and what was really going on in their hearts? So think about this. Jesus has been involved in public ministry for approximately three years. We know that he was not only a great teacher, he was one who taught with great authority. He performed baptisms. Uh, like John the Baptist, but even his disciples baptized. And he even spoke of being able to forgive, have the power to forgive sins. We know that he performed miracles, whether it was spiritual deliverances or even healing the sick, the blind, the paralyzed. He also rebuked the religious. He spoke truth to tradition. He would refer often to the laws of Moses and he, even though they plotted against him and kept trying to catch him, he always managed to avoid the leaders every attempt to arrest him and to try him. And they were waiting. They were plotting. And now it's in that setting when Jesus shows up and he comes to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. His disciples knew it. Jesus spoke about it. He said, 
the Son of Man has to be given over. He's going to be arrested. He's going to be tried. He's going to be mocked. He will die. Jesus prepared him for it. And it, remember, it was Thomas that said, well, let's go. He's going to die, guys. Let's go with him. It wasn't doubting Thomas in that moment. Thomas was a thinker, wasn't he? He was a decider. He had to think it through, and then with conviction, he said, let's go. Jesus had prepared them. So now going into Jerusalem, you have to understand, they knew it meant risk. What's going to happen? And it's in that setting that we kind of dive into the text here in Mark chapter 11. Are you with me? Mark 11, verse 1. Say amen. amen. All right, you're there. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, and so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now this story can be found in all four Gospels. Each have a unique but similar take on the event. We're going to kind of focus on Mark, but I want to pull from the other ones today. Now, you can imagine it must have been a glorious sight, an amazing event to be a part of. You can remember again that crazy event on January 6th, and we even know of some folks that were there. They were even near Capitol Hill and almost got caught up in all the commotion. It's easy to get caught up with the crowds, isn't it? Can you imagine what it would have been like to be there on that day? So we learn here from the Gospel of Mark some interesting things. Let me jump over to John chapter 12. Let me highlight a couple of things there, beginning in verse 12. He says, There on the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now you have to understand, back in chapter 11 of John, we learned that the high priest had prophesied that Jesus was going to give his life in place of Israel. He had already prophesied it. They had been plotting it. They were ready to arrest him, to try him, and to ultimately kill him. It was a risk for Jesus even to go to Jerusalem, let alone to have this open procession where he enters in and then they're praising him as the one come in the name of the son of David, even the king of Israel. So despite all the plotting from the religious leaders, the crowds, well, they're not grabbing at him. They're not trying to arrest him. They're not wanting to give him over. Not at all. Instead, they're rejoicing. They're shouting out to him, Hosanna, Hosanna, which essentially means save us, save us. And they do this in a kind of praise unto God. Yes, they're, they're excited. The Savior's here. You think about that large crowd. There's thousands, some would even suggest millions around in Jerusalem during the Feast of Passover. So thousands are pouring into the city. For sure there are hundreds and thousands present, crowds, it says, that are there for Passover. And it's in that scene, that context, that Jesus enters into Jerusalem. That's on the 10th day of Nisan by our calendar, the 6th day of April, 
five days before Passover. So just five days before the feast, now we understand that Jesus is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He fulfilled that prophecy, but we learn about other prophecies leading up to Passover that Jesus also fulfilled. And if you want, turn with me over to Daniel chapter 9, because Jesus showed up. He wasn't late. He came just on time. And we learn about it in Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, we understand that an angel, Gabriel, was dispatched to, to deliver visions and to explain to Daniel some prophecies, some events that are going to take place in the future. And he records them there for us, and it begins there in verse 24. And we learn about this 70-week prophecy in Daniel here, right here in Daniel chapter 9. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commands to restore and to build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the end of it shall be with the flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. So you've got it there. You've got the seven weeks and the 62 weeks. So you've got 69 weeks and there's a final week. Okay, the 72 weeks of Daniel. Here's that final week. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of that week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So Daniel 9, verse 24 and 25 says that from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, there will be 69 weeks. First, there's a seven-week period. And it, remember, each week represents a seven-year period, so you've got seven times seven, 49 years, and then again, 62 weeks, and that's 432 years. So from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah, there's going to be a 483 years. Now, if the prophetic year is 360 days, which is taken from ancient history, whether you look at Revelation or you look at other prophecies, you understand their calendar in the way that it's being prophesied. We come up with 483 years. That's 483, 360 day years. That's 173,880 days. You say, well, that's very interesting. Thanks. Now, Artaxerxes gave a decree for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Remember, it's the walls that need to be rebuilt in, on March 14, 445 B.C. He tells us there, 483 years have to pass. Until then, the Messiah is going to come and he's going to be cut off. And it's believed that to the day, 483 years later, on April 6, AD 32, crowds of people gathered together to welcome the king. I'm not a mathematician, but I can follow math. And isn't it interesting that this message was brought to Daniel from heaven, just as Jesus came to dwell amongst us. To the day. Remember, he's never late. He's always on time. Now, with all of that said, and there's some wonderful things, Daniel told us there would be that amount of days. Jesus said to the Jews of his day, and we'll come back to this, in Luke 19, he said, 
if you had known even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for peace. He wept over the city. He wept because he came and what? They were not ready. And we rejoice, but we rejoice looking back. They weren't able to rejoice. We know that they were there physically. They were rejoicing outwardly, maybe even emotionally, but they weren't there spiritually. They didn't fully get it. They were celebrating the arrival of the king and even proclaiming that, that for sure, but only on their own terms. So they were there, but they weren't really there. We also learn, if you want to turn with me to Zechariah chapter 9, that Jesus was also fulfilling another prophecy as he was entering into Jerusalem. We read about it in Zechariah 9, beginning there in verse 9, 9 and 10. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, humble and riding a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. From this prophecy alone, we learn it should be marked with shouting, shouts of joy and of triumph. This was an occasion, nothing less than when the king would come, and it tells us there he will be riding a donkey, a colt even, on one that no one has ever ridden, righteous, victorious, and humble. Here's your king, O Israel. Now, if you turn back with me to Mark, hold your place there. If you parallel Mark's account of the triumphal entry, you'll see it also uh, elaborated on in a similar way in Matthew. But if you go to John's gospel, let me highlight this before we go back to Mark. John's gospel says this in chapter 12, verse 14 to 16. Jesus, finding a young donkey, he sat on it as it is written, and he quotes there Zechariah 9. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And then it tells us this. John gives us a little bit of insight, which is left out in the other gospels. These things his disciples did not understand at the first But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. They were there. They were celebrating. In fact, it might have even been one of their coats on the donkey in which Jesus sat. They were there. They weren't really there. Now, John clears that up. He said they didn't understand until he was glorified. So you wonder, was it Jesus in those 40 days as he was then explaining Scripture to them? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? Of course, yeah, we were there. Yeah, you were there, kind of. And so Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Isn't that awesome? Jesus riding in on a young donkey embodies and gives us this picture for us that he came in peace. He came bringing shalom, this shalom that God wanted to bring to his people. Unfortunately, they weren't looking for that kind of deliverance and that kind of peace. They wanted peace, but not that kind of peace. So 483 years later to the day, Jesus comes in fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel the prophecy of Zechariah. He allows himself to be recognized as the Christ. It was a very important moment in history for all who were present, ingrained in their minds. Did it happen? Absolutely. But don't forget he came riding a donkey. And those who watched that day and from that day forward were going to have to now make a choice. The Messiah came, yes, Maybe they often wondered, what was the idea behind Zechariah 9? Why is he coming riding a donkey? Let's get him a horse. That would be how we would respond, right? Let's give our king the the strongest steed that we have available. And, And in fact, let's let all the city know so that there's a great procession there involved. Let's 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 go before him. Let's make shouts of joy. 
and let's get everyone's attention. But it was a little bit different, wasn't it? And it starts with those crowds who have been following Jesus, following the works of Jesus. They're now desiring what you and I would call kind of a power grab. It's time, Jesus. We're ready. Please, let's see a transition of powers. Let's have some liberty, some freedom. Deliver us from the power of our oppressors, the Romans. That's what they wanted. That's what they were looking for. That's what they had hoped in. That's ultimately what they were shouting for. And there's some details in this story for us that highlight it for us, that tell us exactly what they were thinking. But from this point on, now they're going to have to make a choice. Are they going to continue hoping in that kind of transition of powers or are they going to be willing to serve and to follow the king of a very different kind of kingdom? They're going to have to make a choice. And it's not too long later when the crowds turned against him. We're going to learn about that as we do every year. So diving back into our text, Mark chapter 11, beginning there again in verse 7. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now let me give you a little bit of background historically as to why they're breaking the branches and the palm fronds and laying those on the road or waving them in celebration. We learn this from Israel's history. The waving of palm branches started some 200 years before in Israel, after the war and liberation led by a man named Judas Maccabee. Maybe you have First and Second Maccabees in your book, your Bible. If you have a Catholic Bible, you'll have the Apocrypha in there. There's some other books that have been taken out because they were not given, uh, you know, um, part of the canon. So maybe you've read the story about Judas Maccabee, and you have some details there, but this is what we learn. After nine long years of battling the evil Antiochus Epiphanes, they overcame the Syrian army, and then following this victory, we learn this, they spontaneously celebrated with palm branches. And so, it had become a tradition. It was a symbol of deliverance from oppression. So now you dive back into Mark chapter 11, verse 7 and 8. You go, wow, what's up with the palm branches? I understand the donkey. But why are you doing that? And now you understand that they were looking at Jesus excited, shouting, waving branches, even laying down their garments along the road because you could say in one sense they're shouting and they're thinking, Judas Maccabee is here. Our our deliverer, Jesus of Nazareth, save us, save us, waving the branches. Jesus didn't say put the palms down as he told Jesus, put your sword away, but he could have, but he allowed it. And so we learn in all four Gospels, and that gives us insight that they didn't fully understand when Jesus was entering into Jerusalem just what kind of peace he was going to bring. They were expecting something different. And so then it tells us, as you read on in verse 9, then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Unfortunately, we know that this cry for Jesus changed radically in shorter than a week's time, as then they would ultimately, the crowds would ultimately be saying, crucify him, crucify him. Who do you want, Barabbas, the murderer, the thief, the criminal, or Jesus? And they chose Barabbas over Jesus. So, here's another insight. If we look over at Matthew chapter 21, verse 10. 
not a fire alarm, is it? Now, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, verse 10, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Again here, there has been a great progression in faith. Remember, early on in his ministry, they'd say, what, can, what good can come out of Galilee? And now they're like, let me tell you who this is. This is the prophet, Jesus from Nazareth. Something's changed. There's been a progression of faith. But again, what are they looking to Jesus for? What are they really expecting from him? Now, we understand the context again. The religious leaders, they're furious. Many Jews had been following him for some time, and then there was this event that had just taken place prior to this arrival of Jesus into Jerusalem where Jesus shows up and he resurrects an old friend named Lazarus. And because of that, it says many Jews believed in him and began to follow him. Now they're really upset. So they're agitated already, but now they're really upset because remember, there are thousands of thousands of people there and now Jesus shows up, shows up into town. He rolls up and here he is and it's like he resurrects a guy. And now everybody's going, wow, Jesus of Nazareth is here. And so they're not only plotting to kill Jesus, they're plotting to kill Lazarus too. They're like, man, we got to take them both out. Be done with this, all these rumors. And they're shouting this to him, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom, okay, of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, praise in the highest. You know, you and I, we can look back. They believed in Jesus for his works. They believed in his works. They followed him because of the wonders that he did, the miracles that he performed, not because of who he was. And it it was all about what he could do, and that's the wrong view, and that would be a question for us today. Do we believe in Jesus for who he is, or is it the works that you're after? Oh, if Jesus would just do this. Or God, if you would just do that, I promise I'll follow you. I'll obey you. I'll do whatever you want if you'll just do this one thing. Have you ever said that before? You don't have to raise your hand. We've been there, haven't we? And sometimes we stop just focusing and following on him and believing in him for who he is and start wanting to get something out of him. Kind of like playing the slot machine. I know you don't know what that's like, but maybe you do. Jesus isn't a slot machine, is he? And Jesus said it's only the wicked and perverse generation that seek after a sign. And and then ultimately he said, I'll give you one more sign. Even then, Jesus I'll give you one more sign. Just one more. Destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. Now, that baffled them, didn't it? Because, man, that was a glorious temple, and it took years to build. So although they're serving him, they're shouting out for him, praising God, there was a false motivation. That makes me think of Psalm 139. Test me, O Lord. Search me and know me. See if there's any wicked way in me. You know, the heart is deceitful above all things. And isn't it easy for us by wrong motivation to begin following God or to begin making commitments and vows to God? And I think there's a warning there because, you see, they were all there, but they weren't there. They were hearing, but not really hearing. They were seeing and not really seeing. They didn't understand 
Remember, until Jesus was glorified, what they, he said, they, me, including, he's including himself, John's saying, I was there. We didn't understand what we did to him that day. They were there, but they missed it. And they're saying, Jesus, save us. But then what will it take for you? What will it take for me to follow Jesus? What will it take for you to surrender to him? Or what are you then willing to risk and sacrifice for Christ? The crowds praised him, but ultimately forsook him, even his closest friends. I'll die with you, some of them said. Wherever you go, I'll go. Show us the way. We want to know the way. We'll follow you there, Jesus said. Jesus came to save us. He came to save the world. But we also know that the world didn't know him, didn't know him personally, knew about him. But they didn't recognize him, did they? The light came into the world and the darkness could not comprehend it. Powerful. So don't be like the crowds. That's the Palm Sunday message. Don't be like the crowds who are so easily manipulated, pushed and shoved in one di direction or the other. You need to get to know the scripture so you can know Jesus. You'll hear a lot of things. You'll see a lot of things. But you need to know him. And you need to know him personally. Here's a final thought. In Luke chapter 19, we learned this. Now, we've talked about Mark and John and Matthew. Let's dive over to Luke chapter 19. And we'll begin there in verse 39. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd saying, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, even the stones would immediately cry out. How about that? I'm glad that Luke caught wind of that and made record of it. Just as, this was Jesus' response to the Pharisees. Even if they weren't shouting today, 483 years, remember we told you I'm coming, I'm here. If you're not shouting, the stones are going to shout. Man, that's powerful. But they were shouting, and he allowed it because it was true. But they didn't know it. They didn't even know what they were saying. They didn't even know it. It might have even been better if the stones were shouting, right? And then it tells us there, if you read on, now as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. He wept over it. And he said, if you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, this is your day, Jerusalem. This is your day. The things that make for your peace. And, and doesn't the world long for peace? And we're, we're hoping for peace. And, and the world's only going to give a false sense of peace. And, and watch out when the world says peace and safety because it's not that kind of peace. Remember that final week of Daniel? That's a troublesome Time, a time of tribulation such as never been before. You don't want to be here. And you can follow him here. Now is your day. And he weeps over it. And he says, if you would have known. But he says, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For days, verse 43, will come upon you. When your enemies will build an embankment around you. Surround you and close you in on every side. And level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. Can we not hear that warning again? Isn't that what Jesus is basically saying? And I can only imagine the tone in his voice as he's saying. Because I, and he's wept over Jerusalem. And he knows what it's going to be like. It's going to be horrific. The time of tribulation. It's when he says, it's enough. I cannot wait any longer. He's endured and he is long suffering. And then ultimately he's going to have to judge. But he didn't judge them when he came. He came riding a donkey. He came bringing peace. He came to offer peace and he offers peace still. That's what this is about. He says, if only you knew 
what makes for your peace. Friends, don't miss Palm Sunday. Don't miss Jesus' call. We won't need any more Palm Sundays when he comes again. When he sets his foot on the Mount of Olives, the earth is going to shake and the hills will split. He's drawing us now. He knocks on our heart. We're in a time where he's still making peace. You know, you saw what happened on January 6th. You don't want to get caught up in all that. God enthrones and dethrones. He raises up and he puts down. He's in control. He's a bringing peace. He's a peacemaker. And he calls us to be sons of God, peacemakers. Go out and help people to know what makes for their peace. You and I know where they'll find ultimate peace, amen? A peace that passes all understanding. Peace with God and the peace of God. When you allow Jesus to come in, he changes everything. In fact, if you go on, you read the story, he goes into the temple and he starts overturning tables. I really wanted to preach on that, but let me just say it, man. He was overturning tables and driving out the money changers because he said, my father's house should be called a house of prayer. And when Jesus comes into our house, his new temple, our heart, he overturns tables. He drives out false worship, idolatry, and he cleanses sin. Do you know how many lambs would be slain? Thousands. Blood was flowing for days around Passover because they need their sins to be cleansed. And we don't understand because it's not preached sometimes. Jesus wants to heal and forgive and cleanse our sins. If we'll confess it, he'll come in. Friends, Jesus is there. He's the prince of peace. The king came and he brought peace. And Palm Sunday is a traditional reminder for us. And we need to continue learning how this peace is administered and will be administered until he returns. So you don't want to miss Good Friday. Good Friday is just around the corner. And then Easter is around the corner. Amen? Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, which reminds us, Lord, how easy it is to get caught up in the crowds, to be distracted from what's really, what's really going on. Help us know you and that which makes for peace. You, our Savior. Lord, we look to you. You are our hope, a living hope for all eternity. Help us be your ambassadors and ministers of peace. Lord, as the light shines in the darkness, so your light still shines. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing even now. We pray that you would use us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we go out this week. In Jesus' name, amen.